wounded words in literature. What a wounded name, things standing. But who really wrote them? Out, out, brief candle. Could the son of a Stratford glove maker have conjured up such worlds of passion and madness? Draw thy breath in pain. Or are they the secret works of a forgotten nobleman? Tonight, correspondent Al Austin investigates the authorship question in the Shakespeare mystery. Funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is Frontline. I am dead, thou livest. Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. Oh God, Horatio, what a wounded name, things standing thus unknown shall live behind me if thou didst ever hold me in thy heart. Absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world, Draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, knew that the dead must rely on the living to tell their stories. This film is about the man who wrote Hamlet. But whose story are we supposed to tell? Is it the story of the great nobleman born here more than 400 years ago? Brilliant, powerful, and now forgotten? Or is it the story of a genius born here in this small country town? A glove maker's son, a nobody, whose fame has spread throughout the world. This is Stratford-on-Avon, hometown of William Shakespeare and world center of the Shakespeare industry. Every April 23rd, Stratford celebrates his birthday. Nations from all over the world, nations that don't even speak Shakespeare's language, send their ambassadors to pay their respects and to parade through his town. Every year, a million tourists come here, and the good people of Stratford-on-Avon rejoice at this happy union of commerce and great literature. The march from Shakespeare's birthplace along the streets he walked 400 years ago grows larger every year. I bid you welcome to the Church of the Holy and Undivided Trinity. The pilgrimage to his grave is a custom hallowed by history, consecrated by tradition, and blessed by the Church. Exalted figures of the past look on forgotten, as year after year the endless tributes flow in the direction of the commoner. Shakespeare is buried in the church floor. On the wall nearby is a monument to him. He wrote four poems, 154 sonnets, and 37 plays. And many believe he told us more about ambition and royal intrigue and suffering and about love and death and human nature than anyone before or since. But why did the man who told us so much about who we are tell us so little about himself? There's always been a question. And among the countless millions who have stood gazing at the bust of Shakespeare, there have been some who came not to praise him, but to bury him. Mark Twain was one. The bust, too. There, in the Stratford Church. The precious bust. The priceless bust. 
the calm bust, the serene bust, the emotionless bust, that face with a deep, 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 subtle, subtle, subtle expression of a bladder. It was at the wheel of a Mississippi River boat more than 130 years ago that Mark Twain began to have doubts about Shakespeare of Stratford. Twain learned the language of Shakespeare while he was learning the language of the river from a riverboat captain who kept mixing the poetry and his commands together. What man dare, I dare, approach thou... There she goes! Meet her, meet her! Didn't you know she'd spell a reef if you crowded in like that? Come ahead on the starboard. Straighten up and go along. Never tremble. Or be alive. Damnation, can't you keep away from that greasy water? Snatch her! Snatch her, bald-headed, with thy sword. It was the captain's jargon that set Twain thinking. Only a riverboater could handle riverboat slang like that. There are some things you just have to experience. Where would Shakespeare, the country boy, have learned the lawyer slang, court slang, soldier slang, and all the other jargon that fills the plays? For Twain, it wasn't possible. Maybe skepticism was in the American air. Other Americans shared Twain's doubts. Emerson, Whitman, Henry James, even Charlie Chaplin have left a trail of disbelief that today stretches to Beaufort, South Carolina. For 50 years, author Charlton Ogburn and his parents before him have led the battle against William Shakespeare of Stratford. I think it's the shame of the English-speaking people, British and American, that they have taken these plays incomparable in literature of whom the German poet Heinrich Heine said, of course God comes first, but surely Shakespeare comes next. This man who is next to God as a creator, we've taken his work and we've vested it on this miserable, unattractive Stratford man of whom nothing good was ever said except that he was a natural wit. The doubts are getting closer to Shakespeare's home. This is a rare visit to Stratford for former British cabinet minister Enoch Powell whose study of Shakespeare's plays convinced him that the town was built on a lie. At that time, I'd been a member of a cabinet, and I'd been in politics for 20 years, and I had some idea of what it's like in the kitchen. And my astonishment was to discover that these were the works of somebody who'd been in the kitchen. They're written by someone who has lived the life, who has been part of a life of politics and power, who knows what people feel when they are near to the center of power, near to the heat of the kitchen. Uh, it's not something which can be transferred. It's not something on which an author, just an author, can be briefed. Oh, this is how it happens. It comes straight out of experience, straight out of personal observation, straight out of personal feeling. That's the difference. Uh, which comes over you when you read Shakespeare detached from the Stratfordian fantasy. For Powell, the British politician, just as for Twain, the American riverboater, the Stratford man had failed the crucial test of experience. The real Shakespeare was at home in worlds they believed the glovemaker's son could not have known, and the Stratford fantasy had made a bard out of a bumpkin, transforming a common duck into the Swan of Avon. But Stratford's guardians of tradition haven't allowed these doubts to alter the official story. The early life of Shakespeare was, would certainly have been spent uh, in Henley Street here. Uh, as you visit the birthplace, you'll find that it's really a very interesting building. The birthplace is where the visitor picks up the first threads of Shakespeare's biography. But he hears few facts. There's no record, for instance, that Shakespeare was born in this house. Instead, the visitor hears what may have happened and is given a choice of possibilities. What does intrigue um, scholars is what he actually did for work. Some theories are that he may have become a schoolmaster. Other theories that he was, um, in fact, a lawyer's clerk, an actor. There are several possibilities, in fact, of these theories. The tour is so skillful, a visitor may not notice that nothing here can actually be traced to Shakespeare himself. But sadly, None of the furnishings in this room belong to the family. They have subsequently been brought into the house by the Shakespeare Trust 
to furnish it um, in a manner that the Shakespeare's probably would have had. And the family have always maintained that he was born in the room directly above us, in the main bedroom. This has become known as the birth room, and really it's had an extraordinary history. In England today, one of the most prominent authorities on Stratford's William Shakespeare is historian A.L. Rouse. Well, it, it might really rather surprise you, but I'm so used to living in the Elizabethan age, having spent most of my life researching into it, that I feel rather at home. And Why do you uh, suppose the doubts about William Shakespeare of Stratford being the true author have persisted all these years? Well, nearly all the rot uh, that's really spoken uh, by people who don't really should shut up. I had a letter only a month or two ago from some silly woman who wanted to know, didn't I think, Dr. Rouse, that William Shakespeare must have been a woman? And then shortly after, I got another nonsense letter, didn't I think, that Elizabeth I, must, Queen Elizabeth, must have been a man? Why don't they get down and read the books that can really tell them what is absolutely straight history? Your own books? My own books. And then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like a snail, unwillingly to school. With those lines from As You Like It, Shakespeare scholars like to flesh out their picture of the poet's school days. In this very classroom, we are told, young William and his classmates learned enough Latin and Greek, enough of the classical scholars, enough about the writing of prose and verse, all the skills necessary to furnish the intellectual background for the great works to come. Will you stand up? We say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It was early in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. The Lord's Prayer had only freshly been translated into Protestant English, and Stratford's Grammar School was nurturing its most famous pupil. But there is a problem. There is absolutely no documentary evidence that William Shakespeare of Stratford ever went to school at all. Ever, ever. Amen. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all precious past that youth and observation copies there. No books, no records, only supposition, a shadow of a glovemaker and alderman's son who may have gone to school here. One by one, all the fine stories of Shakespeare from the young scamp arrested for deer poaching to the lovesick youth courting Anne Hathaway. All turn out to be the inventive recollections of people who had never seen Shakespeare, who were born long after he died. What is there to be learned for sure about him? He was born in 1564, was married at 18, had three children, died in 1616. What other hard facts are there? Practically every document that's been found tracing Shakespeare's life after he left Stratford for London is here in London's public record office. A William Shakespeare owns some shares in London's Globe Theatre. Several documents show Shakespeare delinquent in his taxes. A tax collector couldn't find him. He's named in some minor lawsuits. The accuracy of this 1595 document, the first and only record of William Shakespeare ever being paid as an actor, has been disputed by scholars. Eight years later, in 1603, King James authorized several actors, including Shakespeare, to start performing plays again after the plague had closed the theaters. But by then, he'd bought a house back in Stratford and was dealing in real estate and grain. No plays, no poems, not a single letter in Shakespeare's own hand has ever been found. In fact, the only examples of his handwriting yet discovered, the only examples generally accepted, are six signatures, each one spelled differently. Three of the signatures are in his will, the most famous Shakespeare document of all, 
one of the most famous documents in existence, period. In it, he divides his property down to a silver bowl and a sword, but he makes no mention of any books, manuscripts, plays, poems, or any shares in the London theater. He leaves his wife just one thing, his second best bed. Written between the lines of the will is a bequeathal of some money for rings to my fellows John Hemming, Richard Burbage, and Henry Condell, who were actors. That's about it. After centuries of the most intensive literary treasure hunt of all time, these are the nuggets. The leavings of a man who seems to have been interested in little except money. Doubters look at this meager collection and see no trace of the creator of Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear, Othello, and the sonnets. They see only a very ordinary man. But in Washington's Folger Shakespeare Library, the high temple of American Shakespearean studies, Professor Sam Schoenbaum believes that the very ordinary man of the documentary evidence is no barrier to greatness. Shakespeare, as people have noted, as the author of these plays, was also a man among men. Uh, uh, genius is not a, uh, uh, an occupation. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that takes up every moment of one's day. The genius has to eat. Uh, he procreates children. He occasionally he sleeps. He occasionally uses the bathroom. And so on. It's hard for us uh, to accommodate ourselves to the, the dual of the multifarious nature of the, uh, of the person who is, uh, as we all recognize, a genius. The Stratfordians would argue that it's like, uh, it's like spontaneous generation. They're like the Christian fundamentalists who believe that life was created bang like that, overnight, all complete as it is. Just the way the plays of Shakespeare were completed bang in his brain without any background at all. How could anybody have thought that a man who could barely sign his name was the greatest writer in the English language? Whom nobody while he was alive ever, to the best of our knowledge, ever identified as the dramatist Shakespeare, a dramatist of any kind or any kind of writer. But the name William Shakespeare was linked to the poems and plays during the Stratford man's lifetime. It was there on two poems published in 1593, Venus and Adonis and The Rape of Lucrece. The name William Shakespeare was on the sonnets when they appeared in 1609. It was on some of the unofficial publications of the plays, the quartos, but the name wasn't spelled the way the Stratford man spelled his, Shakespeare, without an E after the K. And often it was hyphenated, an indication according to anti-Stratfordians that people knew it was a pseudonym. While he lived, the definite link with the Stratford man was missing. And when he died in 1616, no one seemed to notice. Until seven years later, 1623, then the monument was erected in the church. And almost simultaneously, the first folio appeared. This was the first publication of all Shakespeare's plays. Here was the missing link to the Stratford man. In this book, Ben Jonson, who was second only to Shakespeare as a dramatist, wrote a poem to Shakespeare, calling him Sweet Swan of Avon. The name Stratford is also mentioned in the introduction. And there was one more definite link to Stratford in the first folio. Its editors were listed as John Hemming and Henry Condell. Those are the same two actors the Stratford man had mentioned in his will. Hemming and Condell, his um, friends and colleagues during his lifetime who were able to perform this service for him after his death. Well, we have Shakespeare's will. And in his will, as it happens, he remembered Hemming and Condell. But unfortunately, and that is one of the accidents which keep happening to William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon, the references to Hemming and Condell in the will are interlineations by another hand. Isn't that an unfortunate accident, that the link between the actors who are the editors or purport to be the editors of this mass of new material never released before, have apparently been introduced into his will. 
that by the way and having mentioned Shakespeare's will that is a will in which this great spirit this man of, man of immense learning and vision not only bequeathed no books that can be perhaps explained away but he bequeathed not even the most valuable thing which he had to bequeath the remaining manuscripts of his plays which, would, which were eventually to be published seven years after his death trouble is there's a puzzle with which one's confronted it doesn't run right nothing's right uh, Enoch began as a classical scholar and I think he would do better really to confine himself to what he knows about there's no problem whatever about the first folio except that it was a tremendous big undertaking um, which in itself shows you um, the, how much Hemming and Conlaw and all the other people in the company really valued their chief dramatist the best known the most popular dramatist of the age um, people really uh, rushed to buy um, quartos of the plays that they could get hold of but the remaining plays of course um, were in the archives of the company there's no problem about that at all and i think we might really allow poor mr powell um, really to uh, retire upon politics Though there too, I gather, he's lost his seat. Don't want to bother about his opinions whatsoever. Doesn't qualify to have an opinion about it. But nothing about Shakespeare is that simple. No one even knows for sure what he looked like. This portrait hung in a place of honor in Washington's Folger Shakespeare Library until a close examination showed that it was the portrait of another man who'd been partly painted over. This portrait was owned by King William IV and was once called Shakespeare. It has now been retitled Portrait of an Unknown Man. One by one, the portraits of Shakespeare have proved to be as fanciful as the anecdotes about his life. Art experts now doubt that he posed for a single one of them. What do you make of the frontispiece, the engraving, the first picture of Shakespeare? If you have to have a face, and everybody has a face, there is a face. And that is the face of the same design as the face of a monument, the Stratford Monument, to which this book for the first time refers. The first connection between these plays and Stratford on Avon, and how convenient that there was a Stratford Monument. Somebody fixed it. And to me, in its wording, in its aspect, in everything about it, that is a fix. It is a fix which was arranged to go with the first folio. The one spoof goes with the other spoof. And it's all part of the spoof of William Shakespeare. It's shocking, isn't it? It's an absolute shocker. Somebody, no doubt, took it into the workshop and said, here, this is what it's to look like. It absolutely stinks. You don't think that's the face of a man who would uh, write the sonnets? I don't think it's the face of a man at all. I think it's the face of Anonymous, of somebody who isn't a man, of a mask somebody invented where there has to be somebody to conceal an identity. <sighs> I can't put up with it. When remedies are past, the griefs are ended by seeing the worst, which late on hopes depended. To mourn a mischief that is past and gone is the next way to draw new mischief on. What I hope will happen is that the true author will be, will be recognized. It is the greatest detective story there ever was. It's the greatest story in literature in my mind. and. Uh, you can't help getting absorbed in it and excited about it. And furthermore, you can't help feeling its importance. You want the man who uh, conferred the greatest glory on English letters to get his, his recognition. 
It's a matter of simple justice. Just after World War I, an English schoolmaster named J. Thomas Loney set out to find the real William Shakespeare by constructing an exact profile of his man, the way a detective might. There had been many candidates in the past, Christopher Marlowe, Francis Bacon, even Queen Elizabeth. But Loney was looking for someone new, a man of superb education and recognized genius, a man close to the royal court, and a man who had written under his own name before becoming Shakespeare. The search lasted several years. He came across this little volume of poetry here in the British Library, and in it, he found some poems which seemed remarkably similar to the works of Shakespeare. Framed in the front of forlorn hope, past all recovery, I stayless stand to abide the shock of shame and infamy. My life through lingering long is lodged in lair of loathsome ways. My death delayed to keep from life the harm of hapless days. My sprites, my heart, my wit and force in deep distress are drowned. The only loss of my good name is of these griefs the ground. The poems were by Edward de Vere, the 17th Earl of Oxford. At first it seemed that he had written only a few youthful poems, then stopped writing. And yet, literary critics of the period called de Vere one of the greatest Elizabethan poets and the best for comedy. If he did write comedies and great poems, what happened to them? One of Loney's disciples came across a possible answer in another old book. This one, The Art of English Poesy, written in 1589, 13 years after De Vere supposedly put down his pen. It says, I know very many notable gentlemen in the court that have written commendably and suppressed it again, or else suffered it to be published without their own names to it, of which number is first that noble gentleman, Edward, Earl of Oxford. Edward de Vere. Or else suffered it to be published without their own names to it. For Loney's disciples, this was a vital clue. Here they saw a nobleman who couldn't admit he was also a playwright, whose station in life meant that someone else would get the credit for the finest plays and poems in the language. Or I shall live your epitaph to make, or you survive when I in earth am rotten. From hence your memory death cannot take, although in me each part will be forgotten. Your name from hence immortal life shall have, though I, once gone, to all the world must die. The earth can yield me but a common grave, when you entombed in men's eyes shall lie, your monument shall be my gentle verse, which eyes not yet created shall o'erread, and tongues to be your being shall rehearse. When all the breathers of this world are dead, you still shall live, such virtue hath my pen, where breath most breathes even in the mouths of men. At Headingham Castle, northeast of London, the Earls of Oxford, the De Veres, had been celebrated in the mouths of men for over 400 years. An Earl of Oxford had signed Magna Carta. They had fought with Richard the Lionheart, with Henry V and Henry VI. Oxford's fought on the Lancastrian side in the Wars of the Roses. It was into this famous old family of warriors and power brokers that Edward de Vere was born in 1550. He took on his father's easy familiarity with hunting, riding, and falconry, aristocratic pastimes which furnish so much of the imagery of the plays and poems. In 1561, when he was 11, he watched as Queen Elizabeth was entertained in this great hall by his father's own group of players. And a year later, when his father died, the 12-year-old Earl, now a ward of court, 
took another step toward the center of the Elizabethan stage. His new guardian was William Cecil, Lord Burley, the most powerful man in England. It was the beginning of a tense and difficult relationship that some believe provides the key to the Shakespeare mystery. This is where the Elizabethan age began, in Hatfield on the outskirts of London. It was here that Elizabeth first received the news that she had become Queen of England. In the years to come, she would become Gloriana, the Virgin Queen, a goddess presiding over a golden age. And always behind the throne, there was her chief minister, William Cecil, Lord Burley, who had now taken Edward de Vere into his care. Burley, a sly and consummate politician who controlled the affairs of state for 40 years, also kept a meticulous account of his own household. And this 400-year-old record of his family life is still preserved here at Hatfield. These are the diaries of Lord Burley and some of the letters he received. Quite a few of them written by his ward, Edward de Vere. Letters so well preserved they might have arrived in today's mail. Neat, confident handwriting. These diaries and letters give us glimpses into the life of Edward de Vere. They reveal a passionate, headstrong, thrill-seeking young man, a playboy, a favorite of Queen Elizabeth, but a man who, despite his noble upbringing, hangs around with all sorts of strange characters, and a man who is constantly in trouble. For example, Burley's diary for July, 1567, says, about this time, when de Vere was just 17, an undercook was hurt by the Earl of Oxford, de Vere, whereof he died. The cook died. Burley goes on to say that the cook ran onto de Vere's sword and it was the cook's fault. But years later, in a letter to Queen Elizabeth, Burley hints that it may have been murder. He says he tried to persuade the jury that the death was se defendendo, self-defense. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast and them... Many Shakespeare scholars believe that Lord Burley was the model for the devious character Polonius in Hamlet, whose most famous speech is his list of rules for a successful life. ...fledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel. But being in, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy Like Polonius, Lord Burley had composed his own list of rules for a prudent life, for his family's use. This was before Hamlet was written. Oxfordians argue that only someone in Burley's household, like De Vere, could have seen the rules and used them as satire on stage. This was one of Burley's rules. He that payeth another man's debt seeketh his own decay. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. For loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season this in thee. Oxfordians believe that Lord Burley provided de Vere with exactly the environment and education the author of the plays must have had. De Vere's tutor was England's greatest Latin scholar. He received degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge and then studied law. He became a favorite at court and even married Lord Burley's daughter. This picture of Parliament shows Queen Elizabeth on her throne, Burley at her right hand, and de Vere holding the wand of office of the Lord Great Chamberlain. Oxfordians also say Shakespeare was a natural pen name for De Vere. They point to the fact that he was once saluted at court with the toast, Thy countenance shakes a spear, and to De Vere's coat of arms. The memory of Edward De Vere. Yeah. Edward De Vere. The De Vere Society Charity Ball. From both sides of the Atlantic, the colorful champions of De Vere have converged on London to support the cause. Their leader is a 23-year-old descendant of the Oxford line, Charles Vere, the Earl of Burford. And despite appearances, the business of the evening is a literary revolution. 
It's very easy to say Shakespeare is Shakespeare and then to laugh at anyone who says otherwise. But the issue is a lot more complicated. I would like to say something of the Earl of Oxford. He was a great and maverick intelligence. He was a law unto himself. Yes, he fell on hard times, but he was a cousin of the Queen and he also had a claim to the throne after her. He believed that he would become Edward VII. He signed his signature with seven little dashes underneath, which he dropped once James I came to the throne. Of course, to some extent, um, these ignorant people are really motivated a bit by snobbery. You see, they think that only an earl or a duke could really write plays like that. Well, you and I know what rot that is. It's always the clever grammar school boys who write the plays. You know, like Christopher Marlowe, or Ben Johnson, or Nash, or Robert Greene, or any of them. The plays are never written by an earl. When looking for who Shakespeare was, you're already dealing with a very small section of society, and those inevitably are noblemen who were, had the best tutors of the day, who were edu well educated and so on. And the Earl of Oxford has all the academic and intellectual qualifications for being Shakespeare. If it was De Vere, if it was Edward De Vere, mm. Why wouldn't he, he have owned up to it? Um, people don't seem to understand that, that if the Earl of Oxford died knowing that he would be recognised as Shakespeare in his time, he would have considered that a slur on his name and he would have known that his family would have been dishonoured. Oxfordians believe that although their man couldn't acknowledge that he was the author, he left clues throughout the works. More than a hundred of the sonnets are written to the Earl of Southampton. Stratfordians say Southampton was Shakespeare's patron. But De Vere had a more definite tie. Southampton was also a ward of Lord Burley, and at one point almost married De Vere's daughter. Sonnet 125. Were aught to me, I bore the canopy. To Oxfordians, the line makes sense, because De Vere did bear a golden canopy over Queen Elizabeth during celebration of the victory over the Spanish Armada. Over the Spanish Armada. Several sonnets speak of old age and imminent depth. De Vere was nearing death at the time the sonnets were written. Shakespeare was still in his thirties. Sonnet 76. Every word doth almost tell my name. A possible pun on the name E. Vere? For centuries, biographers have used the sonnets to light the dim past of the Stratford man. Now they're being used by Oxfordians to reveal an entirely different person. The Earl of Oxford uh, was quite talented. He knew Italian, been to Italy, and he wrote just a few poems. He never wrote a single play. And uh, he really became a, a most frightful lightweight. He was married to the daughter of the great Lord Treasurer, whom he treated awfully badly, because in point of fact, he was a roaring homo as Marlowe was, and as Bacon was. Um, I mean, it's perfectly obvious. William Shakespeare's plays are absolutely full um, of uh, passionate uh, um, appreciation and feeling for women. Well, the Earl of Oxford had none. Neither had Christopher Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe was only interested in the boys, and Francis Bacon had no interest. He was also another homo. And William Shakespeare, you might say, was almost abnormally heterosexual. He was only interested in the girls. That's quite obvious from all his plays and all that we know about his life. But the sonnets themselves, you think, were addressed to the Earl of Southampton, even yes. though they appear to be, some of them, love poems. Yes, of course. But uh, they're, they're, it's really a platonic love, you see. William Shakespeare makes it perfectly clear that he wasn't interested in Southampton sexually at all. Southampton was rather beautiful and rather a feminine young man. We know a great deal about him. Uh, and William Shakespeare says in the sonnet, um, and uh, for a woman wert thou first created, till nature as she wrought thee fell a doting, and added one thing to my purpose, nothing. And since she pricked thee out for women's pleasure, mine be thy love, and thy love's use their treasure. They can have you sexually. I'm not interested in that. 
he was interested in the young man's uh, nature. He had a golden nature. His real passion and infatuation was for the Dark Lady. The Dark Lady is the subject of Shakespeare's most anguished sonnets. Her identity has always been a mystery. But there was a Dark Lady in Oxford's life, too. Her name was Anne Vavasour. She was 17 when she came to court, at the time when De Vere was estranged from his wife. When Anne bore his child, De Vere found himself jailed in the Tower of London. Was this raw material for the bitter sonnet 147? My love is as a fever, longing still for that which longer nurseth the disease, feeding on that which doth preserve the ill, the uncertain sickly appetite to please. Past cure I am. Now reason is past care, and frantic mad with evermore unrest. My thoughts and my discourse, as madmen's are, at random, from the truth vainly expressed. For I have sworn thee fair, and thought thee bright, who art as black as hell, as dark as night. Lord Burley had put up with his son-in-law's indiscretions, but Oxfordians believe he could not allow the public to learn that plays full of political intrigue and satire were being written by one of the family. So, according to this theory, in 1598, Burley and Queen Elizabeth compelled De Vere to hide behind the pseudonym he had used earlier for two poems, and that somehow this conspiracy of silence has lasted for 400 years. I suppose if one is drawn uh, to conspiracy theories, uh, one will come up with a, uh, with a conspiracy uh, and find that, that that answers certain issues and so on. Uh, I'm not myself uh, given to conspiratorial thinking. I don't find any grassy knoll in Shakespeare. Uh, but I think in a way it's, uh, it's an attempt to come to terms with the essential incomprehensibility of genius. How could anyone have written these plays? If uh, genius has its mystery, if it is in essence incomprehensible, people many of them will do the best they can to come up with some sort of, of answer. I think Hamlet was Oxford, and I don't see how anybody who knows anything about literary creativity can fail to say that the author, whoever he was, has given his picture as Hamlet. This is written from the inside. Uh, things happen in Hamlet not according to a preconceived plot, but as they do in life. And I think Hamlet's death was very much what Oxford had in mind for himself as he drew towards the end. Horatio, I am dead, thou livest. Report me and my cause aright to the unsatisfied. O oh God, Horatio, what a wounded name, things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world, draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. I think that Oxford wanted his cousin, Horace or Horatio, to explain what his situation in life was, to explain that he wasn't the wastrel that he appeared on the surface, the spendthrift, spendthrift, the betrayer of his wife. He wasn't all the things that he's gone down as being which were marginal with him. He wants Horatio to explain what he really was. Your name from hence immortal life shall have, though I, once gone, to all the world must die. I know what it cost him to write these plays. I know what it cost him to have to give up any hope of being acknowledged as the writer. Guys, you read the sonnets and you see it. The I once gone to all the world must die. That's a tragic cry from a man. He saw himself as Lear, I'm sure. Not that his 
kingdom was lost. It, not that his kingdom was made over to his daughters, his literal kingdom, but that the kingdom in which he lived, his works were being alienated from him. He felt as Leah did. And for the first time in his life, I think, Oxford, this really quite haughty peer in some ways, was brought to feel the humanity, the common humanity with mankind that King Leo was brought to feel. And uh, yes, I would like very much to see this man get the credit that says due. Mm -hmm. As a person, I do, I do feel it, his presence as a person, yes. But I think he had a hell of a raw deal. Are there any particular lines in the poems or plays that you always look at in order to call this feeling of loss and sadness most clearly to mind? Well, I suppose the lines that, that do, uh, that make me realize that he had looked on, he had felt with utter despair, that he knew utter despair as probably no other human being who wrote as eloquently had ever felt. And those are the lines that Macbeth uttered when the news was brought to him of his queen's death. I don't think you need having them recited. You know what they are. And, uh, but they do, they, they affect me terribly when I hear them. Can you try to tell me what they are? I'll try to tell you what they are if my emotions don't get the better of me. Please remember, I've been awfully sick. But the lines are, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day till the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury. Signifying nothing. nothing. Yes, I feel that very strongly. Excuse me. But I know how the man felt who wrote that. We all know how he felt. Black, utter despair that's never been so eloquently expressed before and probably never will again. So I like to turn to that to other things he wrote. I don't like to dwell on it too much. But I, I can imagine how he felt, as Hamlet felt, as he was dying, pleading to his cousin to put his cause or right to the unsatisfied. I'd like to help do that. The Earl of Oxford died of the plague in 1604. Stratfordians say that means he could not have been the author, because at least one of the plays was written years later. De Vere was buried here at Hackney Cemetery in North London, but his tomb has disappeared. The earth can yield me but a common grave when you entombed in men's eyes shall lie. Your monument shall be my gentle verse which eyes not yet created shall all read and tongues to be your being shall rehearse. When all the breathers... Of this Oxfordians remain convinced that all the plays had been written by the time De Vere died and members of his family were sure his body was moved from Hackney and reburied secretly in Westminster Abbey amongst the tombs of England's greatest statesmen and writers. This is the De Vere tomb? That's right, this is the tomb of, of Francis Vere, um, who was the Earl of Oxford's first cousin. Um, together with Horace Horatio Vere, and he died fighting in the Netherlands and was brought back to England and buried here with great ceremony. There's an inscription in the slab next to the monument that says stone coffin underneath. Do you know, what do you make of that? Well, I think my hunch is that it may well be that the 17th Earl of Oxford was reburied there, was moved from Hackney Church and buried here. It would be unthinkable for the Earl of Oxford, A, to have no tomb, just because of, of, of the, the sort of person he was, his station, he, the 17th Earl of Oxford, that, that says it all, uh, Lord Great Chamberlain of England. And of course, if he was Shakespeare, 
um, if he gave the world that, that incredible achievement, then it would only be fitting that, that he should lie here in Westminster Abbey. I think what one, one feels above all is a rather airy sense of something mysterious or even untoward here. So I think one gets a, very much a sense of, of history in the present, of, of you and I taking part in it as, as much as back in the 17th century when, when this was erected. Uh, our part is just as significant, and I think it was probably intended to be. This resolution was left for future generations. Here we have these greatest works, literary works of man. Why had they vanished? And their disappearance down to the last line of manuscript is an enormous mystery, an enormous mystery. This February, technology, gamma ray photography, joined the search for Shakespeare's secrets. The monument in the church in Stratford uh, is the most peculiar monument that I've ever seen. Why does it say, read if thou canst? Well, if he can't read, how is he going to read this injunction? Whom envious death hath placed within this monument Shakespeare. Shakespeare, actually. Well, obviously, death nor anybody else has placed anybody in the monument because it's too small. To me, it it can only be explained as saying that death hath placed Shakespeare, meaning Shakespeare's works within this monument. Now, I don't know whether the manuscripts are in the monument. God knows, I have no way of knowing. All I say is that if someone else has an explanation of what this inscription means, let him come forward and say so. Nobody else ever has. All they say is, it's just poetry. I uh, felt that it was worth anything to look in this monument if there's only one chance in 10, one chance in 50, to see if the manuscripts are there, and I'd like to see the monument explored. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost. That, let me tell you, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of. In what a wounded name. Things standing thus unknown shall live behind me. If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. PBS.org, where the debate continues on who wrote Shakespeare. Read and listen to the arguments at recent mock trials, including one with three Supreme Court justices presiding. Tour some fascinating Shakespeare websites on the Internet. And check out the intriguing articles written by both sides of this impassioned debate. It's here at Frontline Online at PBS.org. Let us know what you think by fax or send your comments to this address. 